Welcome everyone to my talk, IPFS, a sneaker net for your geodata. I gave this talk originally at the Global Phosphor G in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania this year. Sadly, there was no recording, so therefore I do another recording at home uh, of my talk. So let's get started. Really quick about me. I'm Volker Mische. Um, I work as a software engineer at Protocol Labs. Um, you might know me from my open source projects, um, GeoCouch and Noise. I mostly code these days in JavaScript. Python is still my favorite programming language and sometimes in Rust. Enough about me. What is all this about? So at the end of the talk, you should know that um, you could build workflows which are independent of where the data is but it rather made, matters which data it is. Additionally, uh, you will learn about more flexible and reliable data retrieval. So this will end up in less centralized services, less single point of failures, so it will be cached local and uh, close to where you are. But let's start again like what this talk is about. So. Some of you might not be aware of what a sneaker net is. It means that um, you bring someone the data by foot. So you do this when it is faster to ship the data rather than transmitting it over the internet. Example for this is obviously in early days where the internet wasn't this fast in, on so many places, but it's even used these days. So for example, um, Amazon has a service called Snowball, where they send out dedicated hardware, where you put on your files, and then you send it back to their data center so they can put it into the network. Or even the um, US Geological Survey as an option to send you the data with hard drives. So it's still done today, but even there are also places where the internet isn't that fast, where it just makes sense to ship the data in different ways. But of course there are problems with this. Because one thing is, even if you have your data locally available, what does local really mean? It could be local to your laptop, so you plug it in and access the files, or it could be local to your network, you just plug it into some server within your local network. Whatever you do, your workflows need to be adapted. So often, if you do especially satellite imagery, you start with get the data from Amazon and then do something. Of course, you need to change it because it's now not on Amazon, but on some local disk drive. And the root cause for this problem is that the systems, most systems are currently location address systems. What do I mean with it? So it tells you where to get the data from. A typical example is URLs. So you know it's on this server, on this path, and then you get the file. Those systems often lead to centralized systems like AWS, Google Cloud, or even the Copernicus Open Access Hub, where you get the Sentinel imagery. It's a central instance, and if it is down, you don't have a chance to get it. So what's a solution to this problem? The answer is content address systems. There, things work differently. I will start with a quick example um, to make it easier to grasp. So let's say I tell a friend, hey, I read this great book about programming. You should really check out this book. What will I tell her how to get it? i probably tell her the author and the title, or even better, the ISBN number. So she can then go out, order it online, go to a library, or get it from somewhere else. She knows exactly which book to get. So kind of the ISBN number identifies what this book is, but it's not really bound to a physical copy. It's not about the book I own, it's about the content of the book. You could even say it doesn't matter if it's a physical book or if it's an ebook. 
the this example in a location address system would mean I tell her, hey, this book is great. Just go to Germany, to Augsburg, where I live, then go into the university, to the library, on the third floor, the second bookshelf, on the left. That's where the book is. And you can already see that that's not really useful, because first of all, the book might not really be there. It might be somewhere else. Or she might not have access to the library. The book could not be there at all, as I said, or it could just be like slightly in a different bookshelf. So she wouldn't have a chance to really get it. And especially because she doesn't really need this physical copy, she just needs any copy with the same content. So how does this scheme apply to data? The easiest way to get the sum content address of some data is pulling a hash. Hashes is simply you put in some data and it gets some long number out. Here's an example of some satellite imagery from Dar es Salaam. And I just took the file, put the hash and got this long decimal number out. Below you see the same number differently encoded as hexadecimal, which is normally the way you encode hashes. And what it does is whenever you put in the same data in, you get the same number out. So you can be sure it's the same content if the hash is the same. But let's look at a demo now. I hope you're already excited. So um, I've prepared a demo um, about, so this is just raw satellite imagery from August from Tanzania. And you can see this is an um, interactive map. So I can zoom in, I can zoom out. Sometimes tiles are missing, this is intentional. So you can see, yeah, I can even zoom in very deeply. And so what you see is it doesn't really contain all the data, but just a subset, which is weird. But what I want to show is that um, I want to see how you can distribute the data and then if I know it's down, you don't have the data, but if it comes up, you have the data locally available. So originally the demo was meant to be, I have this local node currently running on my machine. I have some data, it works. And then I hand out some mini computers called um, Bandana Pies, and someone in the audience would uh, plug it in then I will wait for a while and then you would see the data suddenly appears. Sadly, all this didn't really work out. So in the end, even for my target, the Fosfo-G, I haven't had the hardware ready, but I just did the same thing as I do now for you is. Just imagine, so you who are currently listening to this talk, you get this mini computer, you plug it into your, your um, USB and it will automatically connect to the network where I'm as I'm as as well. So I simulate this I simulate this with um, uh, going to a terminal window. So let's see what we have. So here on the left side we have a node already running. On the right side, let's start with one node. I will simulate that in 20 seconds, another node will come up. So imagine you plug it in now. So we're going back um, to this demo and just wait. Of course, it needs to boot up, it needs to connect to the network, but it will discover itself automatically. One pint, so please look on the kind of like the right side of the screen after 20 seconds, oh, it was the bottom, sorry. So at the bottom, things appeared. And magically, you can now zoom into the data. It's available. Again, might not be all, but at least a subset is available. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can drag it. And the interesting thing is now, of course, it could also be like a, a third node. Let's simulate this as well. 
So I go to the terminal again, I spin up another node. This time it's only 10 seconds, so now this time please look on the right side of the screen. And hopefully, I can even zoom in, yeah, it appeared. So that's pretty nice. But another nice thing now is that I can zoom in and out, and the data is available, as you can see. And even if I now shut down the nodes again, I leave the, the major node running, go back, I zoom in, what you get is, oh, they're still there, how does this work? Well, it got cached on the local node. It might as well be, so you might say, okay, it's cached on the browser, but now I do a hard refresh of the page, and it's still there. It's not cached on the browser, it might be cached, but that's not the point. But it's really available here. And you can see, because if I zoom in closer, I didn't really zoom in closer, we don't get any data because it's currently not available on this local node. But the data that we've visited is available on the local node and I can visit it. So that's it for the demo. Let's go back to the presentation. So what you saw on this um, demo is, it doesn't really matter where that exactly is. So. I simulated locally, but you can imagine I plugged in another device and it magically appeared. As long as it is in the network, it's there. Another advantage of such a distributed system is um, you can invite people. So, for example, someone has a node available which is like super high performance, high throughput, so it's really a fast node connected to the internet but you want people to pay for it. That's totally fine. But now someone else could do a mirror of it, provide it for free, it might not be as fast, but you don't need credentials for it. For the paid service, you need to have credentials. So you can just get the data from somewhere else, but the address doesn't really change. It's just another peer in the network. And it's more reliable. Um, as I mentioned with the hashes, so the data is just stored by the hash, so you can easily verify that the data that you got is actually the same data. An example where this can go wrong um, in the current world is when I was preparing this demo and was downloading the Sentinel Knight imagery, first I had problems with the authentication. I wrote a small script to scrape the data. And then suddenly uh, the cookie expired. And instead of getting back the actual imagery, I got back just uh, the login website. I just discovered it because the file size was different. But if I can do the hash and I just get the data, hash it locally and verify that the hash is the same, I know I got exactly the data that I wanted. If I only get the login page, I would immediately know, okay, that's not the data I wanted, something went wrong. And there's no single point of failure because it could even not be on a single node, but only on five nodes. And as I said, it's just enough to be in the network. It doesn't really matter where the node is. So it could be in the local network, it could be on the internet if you're connected. One system that implements all this, and I've used in the demo, is IPFS, which stands for the Interplanetary File System. Currently, there's implementations available in JavaScript and Go, hopefully in Rust as well soon. The nice thing about being in JavaScript is that it works in the browser and everything from the system is fully open source, it's MIT licensed. Really quick about the components. So IPFS is really more or less the file system layer where you can have directories and symlinks and permissions and so on. Layer below is there are hashes, links, and blocks. So it's the interplanetary link data layer. This is actually the thing that I work on and below this one is libp2p, which is like an independent networking library um, yeah, for doing networking stuff and p2p stuff. And you just yeah implement the transport once and you can switch between transports and so on. So um, if you do any networking stuff, please check it out. 
it's standalone, so you don't need to use the full IPFS stack for it if you want to use it. So now coming back to the demo, you might wonder like, how does it work if the tiles kind of addressed by the hashes, but for having tiles, you really need to have the like the specific scheme of the zoom level and the coordinates, like the tile coordinate. Well, um, I didn't really create well, I did create a hash for every tile, but for this demo, I used um, IPFS. So I just did the tile cache for the whole of Tanzania, and I put in the whole directory into IPFS. So the whole tile set has one hash. This also means, of course, if one tile changes, the file hash changes. This it has some advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are that I know that this is exactly the tile set that I want to have. And if I share it, someone else, you see exactly the same thing. It's not some updated data, but it's exactly the same tile set. This advantage obviously is that I need to have some link that is always updated to, to point with the current um, tile set. I use the directory structure. So this is how I get the zoom level X and Y um, tile coordinate. And so the access was through an HTTP gateway. So of course, IPFS creates its own protocol, but for um, being available today, it has an HTTP gateway. So this was the URL. And as you can see, it is IPFS, and then it's the hash of the tile set. And then it's just subdirectories for the zoom level and the coordinates. And this is basically how also it worked when you saw that the tiles appeared. It was just like, it's a long running get request that constantly that is kept open and hopes to get the tile. And then if another peer appears, which has the uh, tile, it will just suddenly appear. So what are the use cases other than a tile cache? This is kind of an outlook because this is somehow what, what I would love to see. So you could use it for better workflows. You build it around content addressed systems. What you get is the code is independent on where the data is stored. So you could write the code once and of course it could still be an IPFS node somewhere which has, uses S3 as storage. So you still the first time you still get it from Amazon and so on. But it could also be a new local network. But your script does need to change. So every con can reuse your script. You can then um, just yeah, ship the data with a hard drive and have it locally available. Have the sneaker net thing. And another nice thing about this is, as you saw um, the nodes cache the data that they received, let's say you prepare a talk for the Phosphor G and your colleague as well. You both work on satellite imagery. It's pretty likely that you both use um, Tanzania as a demo. So you don't load the data it takes a while and then your colleague also needs the data but if the data is already available in the local network you can just get the data from from the machine of your colleague and not from the internet and it will do this transparently so you don't need to care about what will be way faster to download another thing and this is really what i hope uh, i will get to so this is my 10 years plan is better data distribution. So let's look at how currently the central data is distributed. Currently, it goes all through HTTP and FTP, and it's a centralized system. So the national delegations get the data from the European Space Agency, and then they, the problem is that sometimes, for example, the zip files are corrupt for whatever reason. Then the workflow is to send them an email and saying, oh, this file was corrupt, please send this file again. And yeah, that's super tedious. Um, if you think about it, that every national delegation or every mirror of the data has to do it. So this could be more robust. Another thing is that those delegations um, might only keep a subset so you would keep a large 
area for a short time. So let's say you have the whole world of set of Sentinel imagery and you keep it for, let's say, three months. You keep Europe for half a year and let's say you have a German delegation, you keep Germany, uh, the imagery forever. So the problem is that if everyone in Europe does the same thing, you have something like 10 copies of the whole world for three months. Then everyone erases it. And only the European Space Agency has again copies of the whole world for other times. So you have a lot of copies sometimes and at a later point you only have a few copies. So it would be better if you use a system like APFS for distribution because you would get statistics on the number of copies. So you can say, okay, this delegation stores the world from the first quarter, this one from the second quarter, this one from the third quarter. So you could, for example, have like three copies of the world for a year instead of having 10 copies for three, three months. You could lower the load because you could get the data from someone nearby. So of course you would have a delay, but let's say first one delegation starts to download the data and then the other delegation starts one hour later. So you could already get some of the data from the Human Space Agency, but some other data from the delegation, which is nearby. And you have easy consistency checks. So if someone, something is corrupt, you immediately know it because of the hash. And so this is what I'm working on. So if you have any ties to the European Space Agency, um, please contact me, get in touch with me. I really love to see a prototype of this. All right, that's all I have. So thanks for attention. Again, here's my email address and my Twitter handle. So if you want to get in touch with me, um, you know where to find me. That's all.